Hello all. So in this video, I shall be discussing the Society of Critical Care Medicine Cl Clinical Practice Guidelines given in the year 2022 for the prevention and management of pain, agitation, neuromuscular blockade and delirium in critically ill pediatric patients only. It is not meant for otherwise. So as regards analgesia, in children who are more than equal to 6 years of age and who are capable of communicating, the pain assessment scales to be used are visual analog scale, numeric rating scale, outer scale and Wong Baker faces pain scale and these scales are available in the books of intensive care. In those who are not able to communicate and are critically ill, flag scale that is faces legs activity cry and consolability or comfort B scales are to be used. Observational pain assessment tools should be used in conjunction with vital signs for the assessment of post-operative and procedure related pain and IV opioid should be used as the primary analgesic for moderate to severe pain. Also, adjunct NSAID should be added to improve early post-operative analgesia and decrease opioid requirements in the immediate post-operative period. Additional acetaminophen can also be added for early post-operative analgesia and decreasing opioid requirements. Music therapy should be alt, uh, offered to augment analgesia in critically ill post-operative pediatric patients time and again these factors have been stressed upon but actually they haven't come into practice very widely. Non-nutritive sucking with oral sucrose should be offered to neonates and young infants prior to invasive procedures. As regards sedation, these are very good guidelines and we must follow them. The comfort B or state behavioral scale a strong recommendation or Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale, a conditional recommendation has been made to assess the level of sedation in mechanically ventilated pediatric patients. All patients requiring mechanical ventilation should be assigned a target depth of sedation we want to achieve and a protocolized, protocolized sedation should be used in these children. Daily sedation interruption is not suggested. This is due to lack of improvement in outcomes as has been seen by this group. Bundle strategies should be followed during the peri-extubation period when the sedation is low and this is done to decrease the risk of inadvertent endotracheal tube removal etc. And these are that a target depth of sedation should be assigned, a sedation weaning protocol should be followed, unit standards should be considered for securement of endotracheal tubes and restrict nursing workload to facilitate frequent patient monitoring, decrease sedation requirements and the risk of self-harm. Also, alpha-2 agonist as the primary sedative class in critically ill pediatric patients requiring mechanical ventilation is to be followed. Dexmedetomidine should be considered as a primary agent for sedation in post-operative cardiac surgical patients, especially those with expected early extubation and to decrease the risk of tachyarrhythmias. This is very important. And continuous propofol sedation at low doses less than 4 mg per kg per hour administered for less than 48 hours may be considered as a safe sedation alternative to minimize the risk of propofol related infusion syndrome because we know that PRIS or propofol related infusion syndrome is characterized by acute refractory bradycardia in the presence of one or more of the following that is metabolic acidosis, rhabdomyolysis, hap hyperlipidemia and enlarged of fatty liver and this is specially seen in patients who have been given who are being given doses higher than 4 mg per kg per hour for more than 48 hours. Short term propofol infusion may be considered as an adjunct during peri extubation period and adjunct sedation with ketamine can be considered in children who are not otherwise optimally sedated. As regards neuromuscular blockade, the train of four monitoring should be used in concert with clinical assessment to determine the depth of neuromuscular blockade. Lowest dose of neuromuscular blockade should be used and EEG based monitoring is a useful adjunct for assessment of sedation depth in critically ill patients or receiving neuromuscular blocking agents. Also, Sedation and analgesia should be adequate enough to prevent awareness prior to and throughout the use of NMBA because it is very distressful for the patient. The patient is completely paralyzed but he is having pain and uh, 
he is awake he is not able to communicate he cannot move his body he can, it is so very distressing just imagine a condition so sedation and analgesia should be very good prior to achieving a particular depth with neuromuscular blockade so that the patient has is absolutely peaceful routine use of passive eyelid closure and eye lubrication should be done to prevent corneal abrasion as regards icu delirium use of preschool and pediatric confusion assessment methods for the icu or the corneal assessment for pediatric delirium is the most valid and reliable delirium monitoring tool routine screening for icu delirium uh, with a validated tool is should be considered and non pharmacological strategies like optimization of sleep hygiene use of interdisciplinary rounds family engagement on rounds family involvement with direct patient care and forming early mobility when feasible to reduce the development of delirium should be followed benzodiazepine based sedation should be minimized and overall sedation exposure should also be minimized up to only what is required for the health of the baby routine use of haloperidol or any atypical antipsychotic is not recommended however they can be used for patients with refractory delirium but at the same time a baseline ecg along with routine electrolyte and qtc interval monitoring in ecg should be done for patients who are receiving haloperidol or atypical antipsychotics as regards iatrogenic withdrawal syndrome with these sedatives use of either withdrawal assessment tool 1 or sofia observation scale should be used for assessment of opioid or benzodiazepine withdrawal routine iws screening after a short duration when higher opioid or benzodiazepine doses are used and until a validated screening tool has been developed monitoring for iws from alpha to agonist should be performed using a combination of clinical symptoms and validated benzodiazepine or opioid screening tool itself because we have screening assessment tools for benzodiazepine and opioid but not for alpha to agonists as of now standard protocol for sedation analgesia weaning should be used and opioid related iatrogenic withdrawal syndrome should be treated with opioid replacement therapy benzodiazepine related iws should be treated with benzodiazepines and alpha 2 agonist related iws should be treated with iv and or oral alpha 2 agonist replacement itself to attenuate symptoms irrespective of the preceding dose and duration of alpha 2 agonist exposure this is very important optimizing the environment to facilitate parental or caregiver presence in the icu during routine care and interventional procedures to provide comfort to the child decrease the parental stress and increase the satisfaction level of the parents and offer patients to use the noise adv uh, advantage of noise reducing devices such as earplugs or headphones because a lot of buzzing and booming occurs in the icu of the mechanical ventilator of alarms etc PICU teams should work for making the environment and behavioral changes required to reduce the excessive noise and improve sleep hygiene and comfort for the patients. Also, early mobility should be performed. Standardized early mobility protocol to be followed. So, coming on to summarization, for assessing pain, the scales which are recommended are visual analog scale, numeric rating scale, outer scale, and Wong Baker faces pain scale. in children more than 6 years of age more than equal to 6 years of age who can communicate and those who cannot communicate for example developmentally delayed or on mechanical ventilator for them flak or comfort b scale can be used for sedation monitoring comfort b scale state behavioral scale are strongly recommended while richmond agitation sedation scale can be used as a conditional recommendation to assess the depth of neuromuscular blockade train of four monitoring should be done for monitoring delirium preschool cam icu and pediatric cam icu can be used and coronal assessment of pediatric delirium can also be used also to the barriers to assessment of pain are altered sensorium developmental delay and a child on mechanical ventilator risk factors for delirium are young age cyanotic heart disease developmental delay over sedation and on mechanical ventilation and risk factors for iatrogenic withdrawal syndrome include prolonged duration of mechanical ventilation and thereby prolonged usage of sedation increased cumulative dose administered multi agent opioid and sedative used 
age less than 6 years and developmental delay. Also, summarizing the management for mild to moderate and as a first line analgesic, we can use acetaminophen and NSAIDs. And as a second line, opioid sparing drugs are acetaminophen and NSAIDs, also alpha 2 agonists and regional neurexile can be given. Third line uh, analgesia strategies are non nutritive sucking, music therapy, and parental presence, which is though third line but is very important. First line sedative drugs are alpha 2 agonists, especially in post operative and cardiac patients, and second line drugs are ketamine and propofol. Considering the risk of propofol related infusion syndrome and benzodiazepine, consider the risk considering the risk of delirium associated with it. Peri extubation strategies, which have been detailed earlier, to be followed to decrease the risk of inadvertent endotracheal tube removal. First line drugs for management of delirium, rather they are not drugs. The methodology is to treat the medical disease itself. The second line is to improve the sleep hygiene, perform early mobility, and promote parental presence. And as a third line, we can minimize sedation or in cases of refractory delirium, we can use haloperidol or atypical antipsychotics. As regards neuromuscular blockade, one should be very careful and consider the lowest dose possible and provide adequate analgesia and sedation prior to its use. As regards iatrogenic withdrawal syndrome, we need to use a protocolized approach as we had seen with opioid, benzodiazepine and alpha-2 agonists. And a protocolized analgo sedation is the key thing which the clinical practice guidelines have stressed upon. So as regards iatrogenic withdrawal syndrome as already discussed, methadone for opioid, lorazepam for benzodiazepine and alpha-2 agonists for the same. Thank you so much for a patient watching and please do share the knowledge. Thanks a lot.